But um, I want to talk a little bit about RLHF. Mm -hmm. uh, we spoke about that before we started recording. And that has a very interesting effect on, on language models. So it's not so much it changes their capabilities, but it, it creates an interface for us to use. But in, in the most abstract um, sense, how do you understand RLHF? Yeah, so I, I think, um, so in, in popular culture now, there's actually quite a good meme that explains it. Um, I think it kind of carries the spirit of it, which is this uh, Shogith meme that you've probably seen, yeah. uh, where uh, the idea is that like the base model that's just trained to model P of X, the distribution over internet text, uh, that's this very sort of chaotic being that, you know, has all you, you don't, it's, it's, uh, it's this very like enormous being that essentially has modeled the whole internet of text. And so there's lots of um, crevices within that distribution and there's both good and bad. There's... Um, there's a lot of probably hate speech, but then also lots of very brilliant content as well. Um, and so that's kind of what you get if you just model the whole internet as a distribution and using next token prediction on these large models. Um, and then of course the problem becomes if I ask this model to essentially perform a task by essentially providing it a prompt, like a, a prefix into a text that I want it to complete, then it's it can be difficult to anticipate how it's gonna complete it. Like if I ask it um, a question, uh, about calculus, is it going to complete it as a professor of uh, of math, or is it going to complete it by giving me a response from a random, you know, like commenter on 4chan or like a Reddit post? And you might get wildly different qualities of responses based on that. Um, in reality, um, it's sort of this like giant mass of just people that it's modeled, and so it's like multiple personalities times a billion people on the internet. That's what it's modeling. And so then this meme basically says, okay, well, RLHF is basically sticking essentially like a smiley face on top of this, mm -hmm. where it's essentially giving you, um, it's basically hiding this mess. It's hiding the fact that it's, you know, this chaotic like population of text that it's modeled. And instead, uh, it's going to provide you with a, a, a very friendly interface into specific parts of that uh, mass of people it's modeling. And the way it's doing that is it's basically training, it's fine tuning the model on a reward signal that's um, that itself is learned from uh, human preference data. So basically they collect human feedback data from uh, different generations of the language model and they essentially use that to train another model that outputs a uh, feedback signal for whether given an input, how good is an output. So it's modeling human preferences that's um, empirically collected. Um, and then you use that as a reward signal to fine tune the predictions, the generations of your language model. So treating the language model now in the fine tuning phase as a reinforcement learning policy. So like basically given what I've generated thus far, like uh, and the prompt, what should I, what is the next token I should predict? And so treating this as a reinforcement learning problem uh, where the reward signal is this human preference model. Mm -hmm. And so um, what that's doing is it's essentially saying you started with P of X, which is modeling the distribution of internet text. And now we're going to use RL where we're basically going to start to introduce bias into this distribution. Um, so what, what is interesting about this is that when you train a typical language model, um, you're basically training it with something like a cross entropy loss. And a cross entropy loss is equivalent to um, a divergence metric between two distributions. Mm -hmm. And so when you do this, um, you're essentially, you know, if you had tons of uh, computation and when the process converges, you should expect that your model is essentially learning to model. It's minimizing the distributional divergence, this distance between distributions, uh, between its learned distribution over text and the training data distribution over text. And so basically when this process converges, when you minimize this loss, it should actually be matching the distribution of text on the internet. What reinforcement learning does is almost the opposite of this. Reinforcement learning is not doing distribution matching. Reinforcement learning is mode seeking. Um, so if you had some data where you say, um, I have maybe 51% of a positive, I have 51% uh, of an example where the right answer is A and 49% uh, where the right answer is B, but I can't tell ahead of time like which, which answer it should be because maybe the two inputs are aliased, then reinforcement learning is going to if you keep training the policy to maximize the reward, it's going to always choose the first answer because it's got a slight bias in the distribution, but by always choosing it, you're going to maximize your reward. 
an expectation. That's what it's doing. So reinforcement learning is mode seeking. And so when you apply this on top of um, a P of X that you've learned to dis like that's distribution matching internet text, uh, you're essentially introducing these like mode seeking biases into your model. And so it's going to tend to, the, the generations are going to tend to hone in more. They're going to tend to collapse more towards the types of outputs, the part of the, the, the domain of language where human preferences have assigned, learned human preference has assigned a higher reward. And so what you're doing is you're losing a lot of the diversity of P of X. So you're losing a lot of diversity in exchange for perhaps more reliable generations that take you more into the parts of the distribution, um, the original distribution that had more, you know, higher quality answers. So maybe now if it's tuned to give me good answers on math questions, now if I ask it a calculus question, it'll tend to favor those those uh, completions that are modeling the outputs of a college professor of math rather than, you know, someone who's like asking the same question on Reddit and saying, help, I don't know how to do this problem. Yes, yes. So what could possibly go wrong? Um, yeah, as, as you say, so a language model, it's um, learning this conditional probability distribution conditioned on a sequence of tokens. What's the next token? And that probability distribution has loads of modes. It's like this big hilly landscape. And some of the modes are, you know, um, 4chan. Some of the modes are Stanford University. And we want to kind of like snip out all of the bad ones and all of the ones that we like, we, we want to remain. Now, I guess I wanted your intuition on how this pruning, I mean, can we call it a pruning process? How that affects both the capability and the bias? Yeah, so I think it essentially improves um, how reliable the uh, answers are by introducing a bias. So you're biasing the model to generate um, completions that were favored by humans in the preference, uh, in the when you collected the preference data. And so if you assume the preference model that it's used to train on is a, is a proper reflection of the human preferences, then it is biasing the model towards those that whatever human participants used preferred. And so that itself also introduces bias because it's like yes. the specific humans that are providing their value um, assignments to the uh, completed answers, they're, you're essentially distilling their reward, like you're distilling their preferences. And so the actual humans, the choice of humans for collecting the preferences is very important. Um, because you're ultimately the model is going to exhibit those values as well. And uh, this is at the cost of the diversity of the generations that you can you can sample because uh, rather than sampling lots of different possible paths, where again, like from the why greatness cannot be planned perspective, right? That's quite that's quite like useful sometimes because maybe by generating something that's unlikely under a fine-tuned model, it's actually acting as like a prefix stepping stone to like a better answer, right? That just, that somehow was um, glanced over within the preference function that you learned. Um, you end up generating uh, a less diversity. And so you end up going towards maybe answers that are good, but maybe there's better answers or there's more interesting answers um, that would otherwise be generated. Could I touch on a couple of things? I mean, even before we do RLH chef, when you look at the um, the probability distribution, it's it's kind of it's it's exponentially distributed. So it's still likely to say the next word is this and this, and much less likely to be something else. But as you say, from a open ended perspective, we are making it far more convergent, and you could argue yeah. that's a form of robustification. But then, when the humans give their preferences, you know, we were talking about Good Hearts Law earlier. That's a proxy. So we have benchmarks like Big Bench. We have um, mm -hmm. this human over there said it looked like a good output. Yep. And what what's the right thing to do? I guess what I'm saying is that there's there's what's right from yep. an alignment point of view. So there's morality and ethics. There's being able to perform well on mathematics challenges. And there's this human over there thought it was a good thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on the use case. Uh, so this is kind of tying back to the industry slant because I think that RLHF, in some, it does make a lot of sense if you want your language model to essentially be a Google replacement. If you want it to be a search engine, mm -hmm. then it makes a lot of sense to bias it towards um, a subset of the distribution that corresponds to like good answers to search queries. Um, but this is going to like an example of when this would be in more perhaps direct opposition to a use case to another use case would be if you want to use a language model um, as a creative writing assistant. Right. If I want to use the language model to help me generate new creative art 
in the form of a novel or a short story or a poetry. Um, by using RLHF, you're reducing the diversity of the outputs because you're basically saying, I'm going to play it safe rather than uh, play the wild card and get more interesting content. But when you're an author, when you want to actually create new cultural content that's interesting, you often want to play the wild card. You want to explore the space of ideas. You want to, and sometimes that requires going through stepping stones of ideas that maybe are pretty suboptimal or maybe controversial or offensive. Um, but that's all required to get to somewhere better, which is maybe somewhere where you can't get if you were just following the uh, RL, RLHF uh, fine-tuned trajectories. Yes, and and that's why lots of um, creative people, I think I, I read on Less Wrong, they prefer using the original DaVinci 3 because mm. they thought that the command models were less creative. But um, here's something interesting. I mean, as an open-ended person, 